that's not the one I Okay, I'd like to welcome everybody to Juniper Level Botanic Garden for our Gardening Unplugged this morning. Uh, for those that have not been through these before, we spend about uh, 10 to 15 minutes talking about uh, different topics. And today we're going to talk about hostas. So I assume everybody either has tried to grow them or is interested in growing them. So we're going to talk a little bit about the history and the problems and the good things about hostas. Uh, Several years ago, Hostas was rated as the number one best-selling best -selling perennial in America. And that's a pretty uh, amazing thing for a plant that really had some pretty obscure upbringings. So Hostas in the wild, number one, they are not woodland plants for the most part. They are prairie plants. They grow in the wild in prairies. So it's fascinating that they have evolved to be woodland plants because they adapt fairly well to woodland gardens but where they grow they grow in the wild with a lot of grasses and they actually grow with daylilies in the wild full and full sun and what happens is the grasses and the daylilies come up and they give it sort of a filtered shade even though there's absolutely no trees uh, hostas are all asia natives uh, the majority of the species native to china a few species to Japan and uh, two or three in Korea. I've uh, been real fortunate to be able to see them in the wild in several of those uh, areas. So hostas in the wild, this, these are both wild collected hostas. Hostas in the wild are not variegated. Uh, they're, they're pretty much green and not really fascinating plants. They range from the smallest hosta, Hosta venusta, this occurs, this is the most recently evolved hosta. This occurs in one place, a little island off the south coast of Korea. Only place in the world Venusta occurs. Uh, Ventricosa, which is a very popular plant, this is a Chinese native to several provinces. So what has happened through the years, hostas first went to Europe back in the 1600s. They've been cultivated for a long time and breeders begin to work to see what would happen with hostas. Now, hostas are genetically very unstable, sort of like some of the people that collect hostas. <laughs> they mutate a lot, and they would mutate, maybe get a white streak in it or something like that, and eventually that's where the first variegated hostas came from. Uh, they were usually found around temples uh, in China and in Japan, and they would save these mutants that they found Japan also has some radioactive, naturally radioactive mountains, not due to the bombing, but they're naturally there. And anytime you have radioactiveness, you're getting a lot more variegation. So a lot of the initial variegation came from there. Breeders then learned that how to breed for variegation. So in a hosta, you have, when every leaf, you have three layers, it's called layer one, layer two, and layer three. The center of the leaf is layer two. If you have any streaking in the middle of the leaf, the seedlings will display that color. So that's how you breed for variegated hostas. If it's an edge, no good. You'll get all albinos. But if it's in the center, that's where you get the new ones. So the other thing that happened in Japan, you had a species called hosta subboldiana that had a wax coating. Many of the hostas in Japan hang off rock cliffs. So they would develop wax coatings to be able to reflect the sun. So the breeders began crossing and they found out they could get the wax coatings pretty thick and that's where blue hostas came from. Blue hostas are actually not blue, they're green hostas with a lot of wax on them. And in hot climates like North Carolina, they will be really blue, like right here. Now, if you look at that same hosta in July, it's green as a gourd because the wax melts. So, so when people say, well, my blue hosta lasts longer in terms of blue, that's because it's got a thicker coating of wax and the wax simply melts. Now, how do you get that wax back? There is actually a way to do that. When your plant fades, if you're brave enough, you can cut the plant to the ground and the new growth will come back covered in wax again. Now, you don't want to do that a lot because it does gradually weaken the plant. So anytime you can grow your hosta, the more moisture you can give it, the more sun it will take. So you see hostas touted as good plants for dry shade. They suck in dry shade. They're horrible in dry shade. If you want to make a hosta go backwards, put it in dry shade. 
It really does not like that. Hostas are great growing in bogs, in soil that stays wet. They absolutely love that. You see them a lot of times growing in or near waterfalls uh, in the wild. So there's a lot of myths about what hostas are good. Now, can all hostas take sun? No, they cannot. Not in terms of morning sun, all of them can take an hour or two of morning sun, no problem. But after that, you have to have hostas that are truly sun resistant. So if you look in our catalog, we specify four light conditions, shade, light shade, part sun, and sun. Okay. Shade means it never sees any direct light. If you look on the ground, if it was sunny today, you will never see any light. If you see little patches of light, that's called light shade. Part sun means anything less than six hours. Full sun means anything more than six hours. So all hostas grow in light shade. Probably half the hostas will grow in part sun. But again, morning is better. Keep in mind, the larger the leaf is, the more moisture that plant is going to evaporate when the sun hits it. It's all in size. Small hosta doesn't have nearly as much room to give off moisture. So on any plant, not just hostas, size of the leaf tells you how much moisture that plant needs as a good general rule. So hostas now, if you go buy them, you're gonna buy green hostas, blue hostas, we've explained that, yellow hostas. Yellow was a very interesting mutation that originated and yellow hostas come fairly true from seed, not 100%. Uh, there's some people who say, well, all yellow hostas are better in sun. No, it's, it's a case by case basis. It's not a one size fits all. Same for variegated hostas. There's some that are great in sun, there are others that are terrible in sun. So you really do need to, to look at that. All right, all variegations on hostas are either viridescent or lutescent. Anybody ever heard those words before? Okay. Viridescent means the leaf comes out bright. So let's look at one right here. And as the season goes, the leaf changes and either becomes brighter or duller. So some yellow hostas in the spring they're just brilliant and then by summer they've turned almost chartreuse green. Others come out chartreuse green and then the later it goes in the year the brighter they get. The exact opposite. So all variegated hostas are one or the other. They're either viridescent or lutescent. We get calls every year. We sell these beautiful gold hostas and when we ship them in spring they're green. That's a lutescent hosta. It becomes lighter. It has the essence of light as it goes. So you want to decide what you like in your garden. It's just like the blue hosta. If you want, you can go in the middle of summer if it changes colors on you, cut it back to the ground, and it will reflush. A lot of people use those techniques uh, when you have hail. You get hail damage hostas, you can cut it off at the ground, and it will come back. Uh, the big pest of hostas are really uh, voles, number one, which eat the roots, and deer, number two, that eat the tops. Uh, outside of, I mean, there are people that do caging. We recommend just fencing your property. That's really the best way. Uh, uh, you can feed them uh, uh, something they like better than uh, hostas, which is uh, uh, lead. Uh, very effective food for for deer. Uh, voles are, are certainly another problem. If you go out and all of a sudden your hosta look great and the next day it's gone, that's voles. Uh, there are vole baits that work well, but you have to get angry enough to, you have to get, you have to declare war on the voles. We, we, we had a little bit of luck using vitamin D uh, because some of the voles are, get resistant to rose oil, so we switched to vitamin D blocks. Uh, it's called vol block. It's just a, it's a little brown block of vitamin D and vit voles are not particularly healthy critters. They really do not like to take vitamin D and it <laughs> takes them out. So what about planting pots and bury the pots? Well, there are some people that try burying the pots. The voles just go up over the edge of the pot and go down into it. Yeah, they can go over that. 
I mean, okay. does, it, does it help a little bit? Yes. Do your hostas grow as good? No. I mean, you would have to get a pretty large pot because anytime you restrict the roots of a plant, the plant's not going to grow nearly as well. But it's certainly a way some people use wire cages uh, to plant in. Uh, there are ways to do it. Other people uh, incorporate uh, a gravel-like material called permatil. You can mix that in, and that definitely deters the voles, no question about it. Is it 100%? Nothing's 100%. But, but it absolutely does work. And then for deer, there's, uh, again, fence your property in. There are some sprays. Uh, there's some new sprays coming out that are uh, the extension people telling me you spray once a year, which sounds pretty encouraging. Of course, your hostas aren't up in the winter, so uh, spray once in spring. But that, I don't think, is on the homeowner markets uh, uh, yet. So those are really your two pests that you have to worry about. So let's walk a little bit and look at some different hostas and give you a little idea. Again, this is, uh, this is a, uh, uh, one called Happy Days. Uh, this is actually a sport of another one uh, which actually pulls glory, which does not grow particularly well for us, but the sport does much better. Now, most people don't grow hostas for flowers. We're always looking for hostas that have really cool flowers, and a lot of our breeding has been for flowers, especially fragrance. There's only one fragrant hosta species. It's from China, it's called Plantagenea. It's extremely sweet. It doesn't flower until August. It's, and so, but there are a number of hybrids with that. So if you like a hosta that's fragrant, and generally those blooms are much nicer, and as opposed to the dish rag blooms you get on a lot of the old hostas that are frankly pretty butt ugly. Uh, there are some really, really neat things, and generally, excuse me, the hostas with fragrant flowers are more sun tolerant, almost exclusively. So we have a lot of issues here with growing hostas from cold elevations. So hostas, especially the blue hostas, typically do not like it here in the south. So a lot of our efforts have been to breeding blues that will give us the same foliage that they can grow up north but survive here. And this one we looked at over here, this is one we introduced a couple years ago named Blue Pillow. So this has got what we call Hosta Seboldiana genes, which is, if you go up to Minnesota, Chicago, Boston, they're beautiful, huge big plants. We can't do those down here, so our goal was to get one that we could actually grow down here that would thrive. Those do not like our summer heat at all. So, so that's, again, where our efforts have been to give us some of those opportunities to grow really neat things that we can't down here. A lot of our problem and the reason they don't grow as good as up north is one, our soil sucks, and number two, we don't give them enough moisture. So it, you will see some pretty big hostas around here. I think we've got a few that are every bit as good as what you would find up north but you've got to have good nutrition, good moisture, and good soil preparation. Now, in terms of nutrition, we recommend everything in the ground gets organic fertilizer. We never recommend using salt-based fertilizers. Just, we just, they're not good. They're fast release. It's, it's sort of like if, if you need energy, you eat a Snickers bar. All right, you're ready to go kill the world for about five minutes, and then you crash. Same way with plants. We've got to get people away from the idea that you ever fertilize a plant. You feed the microbes in the soil, the microbes then feed the plant. That's their job. So it's all about taking care of the soil, taking care of the microbes in the soil. Uh, very few people realize what microbes are because you can't see them. But in every tablespoon of soil, there are approximately 300 billion living beings, 300 billion. Think about that, those numbers, that's incredible. And their job is to keep your plants healthy. So you need to take care of them. Organic fertilizers do that, compost does that. That's really the key, is to keep those happy. Then your plants don't need anything from you as long as you do your soil test and make sure the microbes get what they need. All right, let's walk and look at a few more hostas. Hey. What is the name? 
name of the green with the white? Right here? This is a no. Sol oh. what is that Solomon one? seal. Oh, I've never seen it. Mm -hmm. That's so tall. What do you say? There are many different kinds. What is that one? Okay, this is a Solomon seal right here. It's a, now, what's interesting, these are in the same family. These, these are all hostas now are in the asparagus family. So this, what you eat, that's, it is related to your hostas. What else is in the asparagus family? Solomon seals, as I mentioned. Agaves are in the asparagus family. So agaves and hostas are first cousins. They are very similar plants, they just grow in different habitats. So all of the dwarf hostas, and we a lot of people now into the dwarfs, almost all the dwarf hostas came from this species. This is where they started, hosta venusta. There's one other species called hosta capitata, hosta nakiana from Korea that are slightly bigger than this. But pretty much every dwarf hosta has a Korean origin. And you'll see a lot of those as you go around. One of the earliest variegates was this uh, thing here. This is popular back in the 1970s. A breeder up in, uh, in Minnesota took hosta uh, capitata and he got a variegated sport, which he named Gold Tierra. And it was probably the most unstable hosta ever. So everybody started growing it and it started mutating like crazy. So this is one of those, this is Grand Tierra. It's like gold tiara on steroids. So what happens with hosta mutations is once you get a hosta leaf, let me see. Most hostas are what we call diploids. They have two sets of chromosomes. So one of the mutations that hosta people see a lot is it doubles the number of chromosomes. Things don't divide quite right. And what happens when it doubles is you get a leaf that's twice as thick is normal, you get an edge that's twice as wide, and you get a flower that's twice as large. So this is a tetraploid hosta. I'm gonna pass these two leaves around. Feel the difference in texture. So, so the first one is a species that is a diploid. The other one is a tetraploid. So a lot of people like tetraploid hostas because they're much less prone to damage from slugs, uh, they're just much more attractive in the garden because they've got that double width edge leaves. Is this one waxier than the other ones here? It, it, oh, it's different. It, it, so, okay, sometimes the tetraploidy will actually double the layer of wax, absolutely. Um, not always, but in most cases that is the case. So, so the really good dense blues, some of those are uh, double the wax layers, absolutely. And you just see as we walk through, I'm not going to point out every single one, but uh, a lot of different ones. This is another particularly unstable one. This started with one called Fortunia, which is an old hybrid that people were growing back in the 50s, 60s. It was everywhere. And then a gentleman up in Virginia back in the 70s found a sport of this that had the center patterns. This was a mutation. And then that mutation has continued to sport. So this is a it actually has a white band. It has a third layer around it. And the original one was called striptease. Well, that was even more unstable than normal. So it is now mutated, and there's like 20 different sports off this original, all variations on a theme. Some a little wider, some have a blue coat over top of them, some have the yellow and white reversed. It's a, it's a really interesting, so for collectors, a lot of them get into, all right, well, I want to collect all the striptease sports, and there is a lot of them. So it's, it's really, uh, again, for collectors, a lot of opportunities to do some pretty fun things. Uh, right behind you is an example of one that we bred for fragrant flowers. So this one, you look at it right now, and it's like, all right, that's a green hosta. That's not really interesting. But when that thing flowers, huge, huge fragrant flowers and just a floral show that you would grow the plant just for the flowers. And that's what we normally don't see. Not many breeders breed for fragrance because that's the hardest thing to breed for. Because all hostas, except for one, flower at between seven and eight in the morning. And they're all bee pollinated. The fragrant one flowers at four in the afternoon. 
So it's really difficult to be mixing those up together. How long do they stay? Generally one day. One day. Each flower is a single day. Uh, now, depending on the parentage, each hosta is going to look somewhat like the parent. If you look at the hosta in the front here, see that thing with the squiggly leaves? Uh, this is hosta party streamers. That comes from a species from Japan, hosta gracilima, which has small leaves, but they're incredibly narrow and very wavy. So the breeders were able to take that, and that doesn't even look like a hosta to most people. So it's really neat what you can find just by going into different species. Now if you look as you go by, there's one on each side, and what's happened here is this has got too shady. So these are going to have to be moved, and the way you know when your plants are too shady is they, they just start going backwards. They get smaller in size. So these will need to be moved. These, these are in way too much shade now. So when we planted them, they were in more sun. So your hostas will tell you, if you look at them and say, you just don't look happy. They should be getting bigger each year. If they're not, they need to be moved. When do you move them? Anytime you have time. There is not a bad month to move them. Summer, heat of summer? Heat of summer is absolutely fine. We move them in August, July, April, December. It does not matter when you move them. So it, books will all say, well, this time's better. No, it's not. <laughs> the time is when you have time. Okay, great question. All right, let's, let's get down here where I can uh, get a little more room. Okay, we had a question of when do you divide hostas? Same thing, anytime you've got time. There is not a month that you cannot divide hostas. Now, some hostas multiply really fast. Some multiply really slow. These right here are fast. This is the species I showed you. These are some I wild collected on that one island where this one grows off the coast of Korea. Now, these are easy to divide. You just you can just pull them up and go. But on some Oops, excuse me. Let's see if I can get one here to show you. This hosta is stoloniferous. This one actually spreads. Most of them do not do that. Most of them stay a solitary clump. So a lot of people are like, well, I'd like to share that, but I have no way to, to get more of this if it's a non-multiplying. Well, yes, you do. So each hosta, each clump, will flower one time, and that rosette dies. Just like an agave just like a yucca, people don't realize it because you have new ones coming up. So once it flowers, what happens? At the base of every single leaf, there is a dormant bud. So if you, were, if you had really good eyes, right at the base is a little nub right there. So depending on how many leaves you have, this has five buds, five leaves, five buds. Wow. So, if you have one that doesn't flower and doesn't multiply, you can force it to. And you do that by taking a knife, and it generally works better on big ones. And let me do this on the ground, and then I'll hold it up. We actually cut right through the middle. We send our knife right through it. And again, it works better on bigger plants. And they just cut all the way down through and then replant it. And then within a matter of weeks, all the new buds will start growing that never grow. So that's how you go from one to many. So a lot of people that propagate or they spend a lot of money, say they spend $50 on new hosta, and they wanna make their money back, you just go in and cut it and you can actually do a, a 90 degree cuts. And within a few weeks, you got four plants and you can sell the other three on eBay and keep one. So you can make it very economical. Again, hostas that run, you don't need to do that on, but hostas that, that do not. Uh, but again, flowering does the exact same thing. Uh, several years ago, everybody uh, was looking for a shortcut, and they came up with a product called BAP. 
I don't know if any of you hosta people, but it's benzyladenine, and basically it's a it's a hormone that you spray on them and it fakes them out. It makes all those dormant buds break. So every, that was the big thing like 15, 20 years ago. Everybody was bapping their hostas. And you would have, instead of one big clump, you'd have a clump with like 100 divisions in it. Well, they didn't look very good in the garden, but it was great if you were just trying to, to bulk up numbers. So a lot of crazy stuff hosta people do. <laughs> let's see, let's walk through here. All right, so, so there are, there are, People who, in the hosta world, who look for hosta mutations. So mutations are commonly called sports. So these people call themselves sport fishermen. And what they do is they go to nurseries and look for oddities. This is one of those oddities. This was a nurseryman up in Massachusetts. He went to a garden center and found this mutation in a block of plants for sale that looked absolutely normal. And then went up to the checkout and they said oh there's something wrong with that one let me get you a normal one and he's like no no i'll take this and this became one of the most recognizable hostas this is hosta we w-h-e-e-e -E -E. but really fascinating and again it's just a matter of looking for those mutations that you would find uh, there's the one we looked at earlier ventricosa so that's right out of the wild that's what you would see if you saw that in the wild not looking quite that good but very similar to that. Now, white-centered hostas, you'll see a lot of those. Uh, white-centered need more sunlight. You, you might think, well, white-centered, it's gonna burn if I put it in the sun. It has so little chlorophyll that if you put that in shade, there's not enough chlorophyll for it to grow and it'll go backwards. So morning sun is the key anytime you have a white-centered hosta to give it enough uh, vigor to be able to actually grow. Yes, yes. Any of the white hostas need that morning sun. See a good example here? But see, see how much, look at the sun that's getting. Fire and ice, that's what it said the other one. Yep. Now, not all hostas have to be new to be great. This is one of the oldest hostas in cultivation. This is one called Crossa Regal. This was introduced back in the early 60s by the late Gus Crossa. I still think that is one of the most fabulous hostas there are today. I, I, I know there's been a lot of incredible new stuff and there are some wonderful plants, but don't forget some of these old standards that are really, uh, really pretty special. Sort of the new thing that's happened in blues in the last few years is what you see up there is adding blue ruffles. So there were no ruffles on any blue leaf hostas up until the last really seven, eight years. That was something that was really hard because the breeders had to combine two species that normally don't cross well together. So you'll see on the uh, back side of this, if you walk over there when you finish, Diamond Lake, that was sort of the breakthrough plant. Uh, to, to give something that really did not exist before. All right, and I have probably used way more than my time, so I will stop here. Do you have any questions? Glad to entertain those. Is that some substance behind you? Right here, nope, this is, uh, this is uh, to, to, to Sea Gulf Stream. Uh, that's an amazing, amazing plant. I, I love that. Yeah, that, see, I, yeah, that's a big one. Uh, there are a lot of very famous hosta breeders, and this was done by a breeder up in Massachusetts, the late Mildred Seaver. Mildred was this fascinating kooky woman, and she never actually made a cross, but she was called the queen of the bees because she could tell the bees what to go cross, and all these amazing seedlings would have come up in her garden. So all of them are named, or almost all of them are named after her. So her first last name was Seaver, so her plants are sea gulf stream, sea lightning, sea thunder, sea all of this. So she, she was really neat, neat lady. She was a bee whisperer. She was a bee whisperer uh, she, of the first order. Yes. If I asked my daughter-in-law to bring me a hosta from Korea, 
yes. as a civilian, non-plant specialist, yes. would you yeah. be able to? No, uh, okay. not without permits. Now, you can get the permits, but it's complicated. So you have to have permits from the U.S. government first, which is called a plant import permit. There's no cost involved. They're real easy. But after 2002, you have to have also a permit from Korea that says that your plant has been inspected and adheres to U.S. standards. That is really hard to get. Inspection if you're in Korea? You go to the inspection office. There is an office in every country, many offices in several countries, and they would be in, the, they would, you would certainly have one in Seoul, and just look up uh, Seoul Korea Plant Inspection Office, and you would go there and say, here's my permit. I'd like to get a, an, a what's called a phytosanitary certificate. Now, some countries, they're free, some countries they might cost five hundred dollars. So each country is different. So most of them, the, a, lo a lot of the progressive countries that realize the importance of the horticulture industry, the government subsidizes the phytos. So it's it's a it's it's complicated. Any other questions? Tony, yes. Are there any hostas that are deer resistant or either deer hardy? No. Mm -hmm. Now. Now, what's really interesting is the field of genetic engineering. That is going to change all of this. Now that we have uh, techniques like CRISPR. CRISPR is basically you go in, cut some DNA with your little miniature scissors, and you put it in another plant. And what, what they're going to do is take the uh, uh, capsaicin gene from peppers and put it into hostas. It's actually very simple to do. Uh, once, once the public sentiment will allow that. So public sentiment has been very much against genetic engineering because people are concerned about several things, primarily food we eat. I mean, that would concern me. But hostas, you can genetically engineer those all. I mean, I could care less. I'd love to have the capsaicin gene. And all of a sudden, every hosta is resistant to deer. Can you just plant, you know, serrano or, you know, very spicy peppers around here? Well, that certainly helps. It certainly helps. But deer, you know, they sort of come in from the top and they can sort of pick and choose. But yes, I would say within the next few years, I think you will see the public sentiment shift and we'll be able to do some genetic engineering on things like hostas and all of a sudden they'll be growable again. You, and, and that would also take out voles. So that would solve two problems uh, just like that, which would be incredible for people that garden. So I would tell you, if, that, if you think that's a great idea, talk to your representatives and say, hey, we need to be able to genetically engineer ornamental plants. You know, a lot of things have been, I mean, there, if you got enough money, you can do anything. I mean, hell, they've been doing Roundup resistant wheat and things and crops for years. And that stuff we eat, that, that sort of frightens me. But, but ornamentals, I have no problem if you want to make the hostas deer resistant. That doesn't bother me. So great questions. Any other questions? Just piggybacking on that, yeah. I was interested in your uh, plant tissue culture lab. Uh -huh. What you might, including putting the pepper, maybe yeah. people do now in terms of colors and ruffles that you couldn't do before. Uh, what tissue culture basically is, is uh, divisions with a small knife. So you're not able to, to do anything different than you would dividing it with a knife. You generally, it's a numbers game. So when you, instead of, if you divide things and make two cuts, chances of getting a mutation are pretty low. But if you're in with a little knife and you make 200 cuts, your chances of mutation just go up. So it's more of a numbers game than it is anything else than uh, than being able to do genetic engineering. That's a whole nother thing. You gotta have, a, you gotta have a, a gene gun like they have over at NC State where they actually, it's like a, you basically put your genes on a, a little miniature BB gun and you shoot them into the plants. <laughs> it's really fascinating. Or you, you mix it with a, a bacteria called an agrobacterium and then it actually is sucked into your plant and then it becomes a part of the plant. So it's re there's really cool stuff going on. It's just getting the public acceptance to be there.
Other questions? Hope you'll enjoy, yes. Well, are there any that work better in pots? Like, would you go for the dwarf smaller ones? Great question. All right, so in containers, uh, it's, the key is understanding size. The hostas will grow to the size of the container. So the larger container, the bigger the plant will grow up to its mature size. Smaller ones are fine in containers. You need to be careful in the wintertime. If you're going to drop below 20, I would protect the containers. Okay. Because roots on a plant are generally 20 to 25 degrees less hardy than the plant in the ground. So most hostas are hardy to 30, 35 below zero, but you're still going to lose a fair amount. You can get winter damage in that hosta above ground. So anything below 15 to 20, just protect your container for that night. You can bed it down in sawdust, that's fine. Because the ground, typically the ground never freezes more than an inch or two. And most years the ground doesn't freeze at all here in Raleigh. What's the minimum size of the container like to plant it? It, it depends on the plant. So if you've got a plant this big, okay. you're going to need a 15 gallon yeah. plant. Okay. But a smaller hosta, yeah, you can easily grow a smaller one in a, a, a gallon pot, a one gallon pot. So a six inch pot for a small hosta. Okay. But the ones that I buried, it's like five gallon ones. Yes, uh huh. The bigger, the better. Because if you had that in a five gallon, you buried it, that's going to restrain that plant and it's going to make it very unhappy. So it really does depend on the size of the plant. So I know in our catalog, we will tell you. This plant matures at two feet tall by four feet and use that size to dictate your pot size. What if you use one of those mesh anti-bold things? The roots would still be able to grow a little more? Or would it still yes, be yes. No, it's, that's better. That's, that's a, a more ideal thing. But the mesh, if you ever want to dig it up and divide it, it's a, it's a mesh. <laughs> but, but. <laughs> but but yes that that does work better cuz it does not have the restrictions on roots absolutely